Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today, we're thrilled to be talking to uh, the creator, uh, Raul Peck, regarding his latest project, uh, Silver Dollar Row on Amazon Prime. I'm going to introduce you to the AFCA members who are joined us thus far, starting with Al McGee in South Florida and Hello. Reggie Pounder Hi. in Chicago, although he's now in LA. Uh, we'll have several other AFCA members join us uh, as we uh, speak today. Uh, but for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and get started now. And so I will see you guys on the other side. It was town is what we always called it. Grandma's taking us to town. It was a beautiful memory until I became an adult and realized some of the things that happened that made me think this is not such a pretty place anymore. Growing up here on Silver Dollar Road was so magical. It was the one place you could go, you wasn't worried about being targeted by the law. That property was so valuable, and not from a monetary standpoint, but valuable because of the history. The first owner of the property, he was born in slavery times. My great-grandfather died without a living will. Before he died, he said, whatever you do, don't let the white man have my land. This is our land. Mm -hmm. This is our water, our club, everything. This is our land. Okay. This is our land. Oh, yeah. This is our club, our space, anything. There's word of a part of the property being sold to someone else that the family had no knowledge of. We was getting threats. It came down and put eviction notice on a lot of Curtis and Melvin houses. Hey! My uncle Melvin told me, I need your help. If they're saying we have to sign our rights away or go to jail, I'm going to jail. It was heartbreaking to see them chained. I went in at 52 and come out at 61. They took the best years of my life. We fighting power. We fighting money. What are you doing? They really wanted this language. Can't you see that you're breaking? If you clear out Silver Dollar Road, what you gonna do with us? What you gonna do with poor people, period? The family gets shot from the rooftops. The truth. Nobody will listen to them. This is ours. Our ancestors left this here for us. All of this is what you're fighting for. Hello, Raul. I'm, I'm Reggie Ponder out of Chicago, as Gil said, and um, I agree with Gil that, wow, what a what another Im impactful piece of work here. Uh, and, and there's so much so much there. What do you want? What would you hope people take away from this? Do you do you want this to be a warning call for folks to say, hey, this might be something that could happen to you? Do you want to to help the uh, the people who you are showcasing? You know, get some kind of restitution. What what do you want this to ultimately do? Uh, well, there is uh, many lawyer uh, layers to to most of my film, even though this one is uh, quite particular. But I would easily put it as almost a trilogy, uh, with "I am not your Negro," exterminate all the brutes. And Silver Dollar Road, you know, it's it's the same equation. It's about the original story, you know. How did we get there? You know, how did we get to the current state, socially, economically, uh, politically, in this country? Because it's the core explanation. Land is the bottom line. Land that was first uh, captured by the Europeans from indigenous who never said that that land belongs to them. They were curator of that land. So the, the, even the, knowledge, the, the concept of land propriety came from Europe. It's, it's what started the capitalistic uh, 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 society and economy. So when they came on the whole continent, decimated the first huge genocide 
a population that went like 90% uh, down within a century. Then they brought enslaved people to this continent to work on that land. And by the way, both communities never had access to any land, you know, for the almost the whole history of the United States. Okay. But every new immigrant wave got access to land. The whole campaign to the West was about giving land to a white population mostly. And so they could build wealth. So everybody knew in order to build economic prospect, economic wealth, you need to have the currency, which is land. This is the acceptable, the accepted uh, currency, you know, but you deprive big part of the population from access to it. And when they did, like in the case of the Reals family, and when they were able after slavery to buy, you know, usually bad land, you know, swamp land, uh, coastal land, which was very sandy, they made something out of it. And then in the 19, 19 20, they started being uh, wanting to take back that land because that land was now prospered. And that's when the violence started. You know, sometimes we say, well, racism started. No, it was about taking away land from black uh, landowners. And they started terror, lynching, burning down to push the black population north or to abandon their land. So that's the whole story in the nutshell. So this particular film, even though it gives you a more personal, uh, uh, really close to your heart type of story, but it's still within the bigger structural bias of this country. And so it fits totally in, in my line of work, which is always, you know, to give you the origin story and the structural uh, 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 body of that, that enables such injustice to not only exist, but to continue to these days. Wow, well, thank, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Good afternoon, Raul, I really enjoyed this documentary. And, uh, and uh, you did a very, very great job with this documentary. Now I see that you read an article in the New Yorker to help you to well finally develop the story, and you you read the story in the in the New Yorker, and uh, when you read the story, what what really inspired you to say, well, let me do more than what's on the printed page, and also what's that this one, this story, uh, apart from your other documentaries? But I'm totally impressed with this uh, documentary. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. But in fact, it happened totally differently. Uh, you know, after the success of I Am Not a Negro, the success of Exterminate, I, I had a lot of offers and, and stories offering. Uh, and it was, of course, way too much for, for me. Uh, I had to make choices. And, and when Amazon, uh, together with uh, uh, um, Juvie's production, uh, Viola Davis and uh, Julius Stenon, a company, approached me to, you know, to because they had bought the rights to the story uh, from the New Yorker and ProPublica, who are also partner in this project. So uh, they approached me to be the executive producer of a project and, and to produce it. And, and of course, I, I discover very rapidly the link to the to the core story, as I call it, and and it was the perfect, uh, extraordinary example of of what what is going on. So when I visited the family, I I really uh, you know frankly fell in love with with them because it reminds me of my own family of people I knew. Uh, you know, as you know, I I come from Haiti, and and we have also uh, similar uh, uh, land problems like most in the third world and and uh and I felt at home you know I recognized the you know the the even the 
the geography, the nature there, and walking uh, uh, with with, with uh, some of them in the forest and go on the river, go on the water. You know, I, I felt uh, in, in a neighborhood I knew. So it became more personal for me. And so it was then the, the not the difficulty, but I, I had to make choices in terms of how to make a film that would not just go into the usual approach of victimizing uh, black characters uh, or traumatizing people. I needed to have almost a film that would empower you, that would give you courage, that would make you angry, of course, but you would not feel defeated. And mm -hmm. I needed to show a strong, loving, uh, fighting family. And that's why I took a lot of time at the beginning of the film to really put them at the center. And yeah. another decision was to make sure that they tell the story themselves, that Mammy and, 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 and Kim would be the storyteller in, in, the, in the story. Yeah, also, you mentioned that you're from Haiti. And uh, I, I taught at HBCU for 10 years. And my uh, assistant uh, to the school was Haitian. And he said to me, how come black people don't own a lot of land here in the United States? And I guess he didn't know all of the history. How much of the history did you know about this, how white people just took land from black people before you read the article, before you did the documentary? Because again, my assistant uh, professor, he, uh, he, well, from that statement, he did not know the history. And I couldn't well, really well, screw them uh, on the history. I think it, it was probably a mis misunderstanding because the history of Haiti, maybe he he conf uh, how do we say con was confused by the fact, indeed, in Haiti, you know, the enslaved re rebelled, and they earned their independence in 1802, when there was still slavery in in the United States. In fact, Haiti was boycotted by the United States for 60 years. They didn't want to recognize our independence because it was a bad example for the US. And we Haitian are very proud to say we are the first free republic in the Americas, not the United States, because the freedom was just for one part of the population. And in Haiti, in our first constitution, 1804, any fugitive who set foot in Haiti, whether white, uh, Indian, or, or uh, indigenous, or black, is a Haitian and is a free man or a free woman. And that, of course, was unacceptable, unacceptable for the US administration, the US power. And so, yes, there is something natural for Haitian to know, well, we know you need land to build wealth. And by the way, that was one of the problems in the building of a nation for Haiti is one part to be embargoed by the powerful West powers, France, the United States, uh, uh, England, but it's also inland, most of the most of the enslaved, what they want to do is not to work for anybody else. They wanted their piece of land. So that was the first big land redistribution in the Caribbean and in the America, because all the other country in Latin America were still in colonial situation. So it's it's it was one of the major things that split the country because you had on one part huge mass of former enslaved who just wanted their peace of mind and have their peace of land. And a central administration who wanted to keep the large structure of the former plantation because they knew that in terms of economic prosperity and, and selling merchandise to, toward the world, it's of course much more um, efficient, but that was a political uh, split, split in Haiti that we we paid uh, uh, a lot uh, uh, about it, and uh, and of course the embargo from the superpowers. 
Yeah, but uh, getting back to my original question, how much did you know about how white people oh. took land away from African Americans oh, when they owned the land story. after slavery? I always knew about that story. You know, I, I you know, in exterminate all the brutes. By example, I tell the story that all the founding fathers were land owner or were real estate right. men. You know, mm -hmm. that that's tell you something. You know, to have power in this country, it was always about land. Land is like the the, the original sin of this country. It started by stealing land, and then the, the rest follow. Why would you steal land if it's not important? Right. You Thank know? you. Thank you very much. You know, Mr. Peck, we're certainly looking forward to seeing that story about uh, Haitian liberation and uh, the aftermath, particularly uh, in, you know, the penalties that were uh, levied on the country by France, you know, and how uh, the United States and others uh, turned their backs on, on the Republic. Uh, but getting back to Silver Dollar Road, um, how did you go about developing trust and confidence with uh, with some of the participants? Uh, how did you begin? How did I mean? How long did it take you before they allowed you to sort of break in, yeah, uh, and get behind uh, the veil, if you will, of their story? Yeah, uh, I'm going to answer that right away. And just to even to your uh, comment before the question, you know, for me, it's really important that with all understand that we have one history it's our common history people have started you know to separate us the history of haiti was the model for frederick douglas for all the you know frederick douglas came to haiti he was an ambassador to haiti because all those leaders john brown his model was haiti the haitian revolution mm -hmm. so our story is linked but unfortunately people don't know it and they divide us. You know, we were the bad example because otherwise the enslaved would have revolted much earlier in the United States. I'm sure. So, yeah. So, uh, so my fight is also a fight against ignorance, basically. That that you know that ignorance that uh, not only, of course, white people, but also vast uh, uh, numbers of, of our black brothers who don't know our history. Absolutely, absolutely. And another interesting so, story would be a look yeah, at the so top. Yeah, so to your question, I'm yeah. going to answer your question. And, sure. Uh, of course, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, one of the first things you know how to do is to, to gain the trust of the people you're working with or you're making a film about. Uh, in that instance, it was quite different because Lizzie Presser, who uh, from Publica, the journalist who, who wrote the story, she spent almost three years in the region and with the real family. And that's one, one of the things, by, by, uh, by the way, who really impressed me because when I went there the first time, it was with Lizzie. And I felt this, you know, this white young journalist, you know, she was totally at ease with the family. They have welcomed her. They trusted her because for once they had somebody who wanted to tell their story, their side of the story. And Lizzie spent a lot of time with them. So coming there with Lizzie was the first uh, door opening. And, and the second one is that I visit them the first time uh, during the uh, 95th anniversary of grandmother uh, 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 Gertrude. So all the family were there and part of the family who came from, you know, from Texas, New Jersey, uh, New York, uh, Atlanta, you know, so it was an occasion to meet several layers of that family from several, I would say, uh, 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 field of work. So, and some of them knew my film, I Am Not Your Negro. So you can imagine what introduction that was. So within, within the same day, you know, I felt at ease within the family as well. And they opened their door. Uh, for for me and my team, uh, because for them, making this film was uh, vital, you know. And and just an anecdote: when we were, you know, uh, we invited Mamie and Kim to the premiere at the Toronto Film Festival, and in the first Q and A, 
what Mamie said as as the new matriarch, she said, you know, somebody asked her, you know, how do you feel now with the film? And she said, you know, for the first time in, in more than 20 years, I feel lighter now because I feel that I don't have to support alone the, the, the weight of telling this story. Now there is a film helping me doing that. So I knew that, you know, it was really a collaborative process and the whole family was behind the film. So I was really welcome. And, and you see how they, you know, they open up, you know, they, you know, I, I'm not sure any family would have been, you know, telling, uh, uh, you know, somebody from elsewhere, all their pain, the, the way they did, you know, they were not hiding anything. And, and that's what really touched me. Yeah, you definitely saw the connection between uh, the family members and, and with you and your crew. So uh, again, that's only due to your your touch, your expertise in the matter. So thank you so much for explaining that, breaking it down, Carolyn. Thank you so much for joining us again. Like we, um, whenever you join us, is always for a topic that really that delves into like the humanity, but also the trauma of Black history and Black culture. And um, of uh, I think a film like this is very important because, as you mentioned, just on talking to Gil, you said like um, the want of possession of land is the original sin. Like even going back to the Bible, you know, with uh, Cain and Abel that their whole situation was about possession, you know, of land and trying yeah. to claim that peace. But I think for me being a Bajan as like coming from the Caribbean, like yourself, um, we have this, this thing about wanting to own our land, you know, in Barbados, we call it a, um, only a piece of the rock, you know, like the, it's an island, like is infinite, same thing as Haiti. And like, it's like the, the, the land is finite, but yeah. For I think for us, for Black people, because of our heritage and because of our history of being brought over for forcefully from Africa, being taken in from our ancestral home, like owning land isn't necessarily only isn't necess for a lot of us about the greed of owning property. It's about having a connection to the land that we were made to cultivate. You know, our I'm ancestors were forced to cultivate, so we claim ownership in that way. You know, and so for the like the family for the reals like. The owning this land, having possession of this land, isn't about corrupting it. It's about just like claiming it as their heritage. So can you it's talk their about, identity. It's their it's identity their, as identity. well. Yes, exactly. So talk about um just bringing this their this idea using um the word concept of identity connected to the land to the story and how this family was said this is this is who we are. This is how we claim our identity. Like you people brought us here, and now you're trying to take it from us. You know, and so talk about that aspect of the film and not and just the aspect of like, claiming identity and ownership for land that we were made to cultivate and like have, in a sense, have a right to claim. Yeah. Well, as you can see in, in the film, most of the people uh, from the real family, when they talk about this land, you, you, you know, it's not about money. It, it's more than that. It's about it's of course, it's their livelihood, but it's also their their peace of mind i say one one of the former military he said that's where i come to have peace of mind uh, when mammy says well that's where we we come to to not feel targeted uh, or harassed um uh, that's where the children they say well we can, we come there every year to, in uh, summer vacation and we meet everybody and for the community, most black people in in the county, uh, it was the only place to come to the to the water. Everything else was was sold, and they had no access to it. So it's much more than owning the land with a piece of paper. It's also what the land represents for a whole community, like also in an African. Uh, territory when land is much more than you know it's and by the way land as you know that's mine that's very european and capitalistic concept is is not as as uh, taken like this in most uh, uh black community you know it's usually the first thing it's it's collective most of you know the approach to land is collective 
you know so uh yes and and you can see it repeated many times in the film itself that uh you know it's not about the 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 money value of that land but it's what it means uh, they have three cemetery on that piece of land three you know i was you know one of them we discovered far away we had to go between the bushes to discover and and push back the the trees and so it means they, they have been there all their life gertrude the 95 96 now uh, uh, year old grandmother she was born on the land so those people they that's the only place they knew all their life so when those two uh, grown up men, uh, you know, basically elderly are, are ordered by a judge to say, you have to vacate your land. It doesn't click. It doesn't make sense. And of course, they say, we prefer to go to prison. If, if the choice you're giving us, we will go to prison. That's that's strong. That's strong. That it means, and and I could see it uh, again. That's something uh, that was my own feeling talking with with uh, 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 La Curtis, you know. And there was some sort of sometimes it's not in the film, but it's something that we talk about. Is almost like I had to defend the land for for everybody else. I I did that sacrifice for my my mother Gertrude. You know, you could feel that. It, it was not just about him losing where his house is. It was about, that's my calling for the family. You know, I need to sacrifice myself. Great, thank you. And yeah, it's not, I don't think it's, I, for me, I think it's not only about sacrificing for the family, but I think it's for the land itself because once it becomes developed, it's going to become polluted. You know, it's going to become forever changed. It's not going to be the land that they knew it as it's not going to be nature the water print is going to change so i think he's, they 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 said well, that, that, that is normal for them it i mean yeah, they like, question they're, that part they're, they're um the, there's a particular term they're like i'm um, stewards right they're, they're stewards of the land you know so yeah, like that's abso part of it absolutely as well. absolutely and and also don't forget it's like the the last village to mm. defend themselves it's resistance as well mm. you know because they they nobody else have that kind of land in the region anymore no yeah. black family they are really the last ones mm. yeah thank you so much thank you 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 know what what come, two things come to mind uh hearing you talk about this is that uh, uh first the thing that comes to mind about not really owning the land from a, a greed perspective is even how they treat the water and and what the water meant not just uh to to use it but to actually be a part of that in in some kind of way so that comes to mind and i know you'll you'll speak to that and then the other thing is that you talked about um her not having the weight of having to carry it anymore at least not all of it because of of, of the film and so i'd be interested in it seems that when you talk about your the, like this is part of a trilogy that maybe you you are carrying if not the weight the responsibility of telling this story. So if you could speak to both, that would be great. Well, the, to the first uh, uh, aspect, uh, um, you know, if there is a graphic in the film where you see basically going from the property itself, uh, the the sixty five acres, and you see the surrounding. And what you see is basically all the lands around it are cut in pieces. You can see visually the development. So it's really almost a history of capitalism in that region. And when the, the nephew, who is the last one to own a boat, to be on the water, who goes fishing, shrimping every day still, and he's telling you that the last couple, three, four, five years, they have been trying to shut down their livelihood because, of course, they wanted it for big yacht, for tourism. So that's, it's an economical uh, process. And when Mammy tells you, and, and that's why, it's, you know, for me, uh, this woman, not only that she understand her, her history and her family's history, but she understand also, also what it means 
classes in a in a society. When she said at some point, you know, once they take everything and we can't pay for our houses anymore, everything is too expensive. What are they going to do with us? Black, she started to say black people. And she said, what are going to do? Are they going to do to us poor people? That's a class analysis right there. So that's, you know, and, and it was so important for me in this film to let these people talk. They are not dumb. They are not uneducated. They know perfectly what's going on. That's that's what they live through. When, when Melvin, who didn't finish high school, say, well, Beaufort was black. And, and indeed, when you check in the history, 52% of the population of Beaufort was black. Today, well, while we were there, I went, you know, walking in Beaufort. I felt, felt like a stranger in a foreign land. The only black person I, I met was crossing rapidly the streets because it was a worker from one of the restaurants going to work. Not a single black person in the streets of Beaufort. So that that's what's going on. So that that's uh, and then when you speak uh, about wealth, you know, or the weight, uh, uh, you know, it's like this family are the testimony of that story, and it's heavy on their shoulder. It's like being in resistance in a county where everybody else. Are okay with what's going on, the judges, the 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 mayors, the the uh, lawyers. That's why they, they couldn't get a lawyer. That's why the the the, the brothers stayed in, in jail that long. They were being abused, and any lawyer who would defend them, if he wants to stay in that neighborhood, if he wants to have further clients, he he you know he he have uh, he cannot take on this case. So that's that's a whole structural uh, uh, situation bias that that are against them. So you can imagine it's like when they go to you know th th this bridge that they <laughs> cross. You know I show in the film. It's like going to a foreign country. You know, and you know that you have no rights there. Everything is against you. So that's something that weighs on you. And, and as, as a woman and having to be the front person for this, having to be the person who keep the family together, because you can imagine what kind of tension that can erupt within the family as well. You know, so it's it's tough. And 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 mommy, you know, is, she deserved all the accolade we can give her, you know. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Nancy Green with Film Critique. Hi. And I wanted to know, hi, um, I wanted to know with the history that you um, teach people basically in this film, what are you hoping the impact will be when people learn more about this? Well, uh, really, frankly, I don't really uh, ask myself about that. And I think the impact, it's, it's whatever you as well do with it. You know, I, I'm not the, the owner of, of the impact. So, uh, you know, as all my film, I hope it, it's a mixture of, of learning uh, in a good way, not in a, you know, a, a, a paternalistic way. It's really, you know, know your history type of approach. And then because as Baldwin said, you know, if you don't know your history, you can't fight. You you have the wrong the wrong information, so you can't fight well. You can defend yourself. You can fight. You know, it's like closing your eye and and sending your 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 fist everywhere. So know your history and 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 I try in all my films to to show the structural aspect of everything because that's important. You know. And and the third aspect is you know it's it's always about today you know I don't make film about the past I make film about how to understand what's going on now and how how we can fight what's going on now 
Mm -hmm. And and so the impact, yeah, I I you know I've been showing the film in many places uh, throughout the country, and I see the the first reaction is of course anger. Mm -hmm. The people are angry, and then the next question is, what can we do? I say, well, whatever you can, because each one of us we can do something. Mm -hmm. You know, be informed and see. You know, there are many groups, by the way, in all those county and states who have been fighting. Uh, uh, the problem of hair's property. Mm -hmm. You know, most family, and, and I'm I'm sure all of you here on this call can share a similar story, which didn't uh, end on, in prison, uh, but who, where your family lost land. You know, uh, every day I meet people now and say, oh, you know, that happened to my family. Or some, uh, so I have a filmmaker friend, a black filmmaker friend, he say, that, that's incredible. That happened just six months ago. But I was able, because I had some money, to buy back the land. Everybody has some sort of story. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we came from somewhere. So, so and most of the time, it's somewhere where our ancestors had land, as, as little as it was. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it, in terms of the work I try to do is, is that, you know, to make sure that I, I make film that not only uh, help us in our fights today, but also films that will survive and maybe the next generation can, will be able to do more with it. Great, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Raul, one thing I really enjoy is the reels. I really admire this family. And the reason I admire this family is because they know their family history. I myself been trying to find my family history too, but through all kind of resources. And I really admire this family and I love the, the tenacity that they're not giving up. They've been going to the courts for over 30 years now. But what was some of the challenges that you faced while you was filming this documentary? Did you have any challenges from the family, from the local people, uh, anything like that? What kind of challenges did you face while you were filming this documentary? Well, you know, uh, the good thing about that is that Lizzie Presser had done the legwork. She went to see everybody, including uh, the white gentleman who owned the property as of last year uh, because he sold it since then. So I was aware of everybody there. I was aware of the mayor's position. I was aware of the judge's position. Uh, I was aware of the work of the scholars in the region. Uh, I was aware of the work of many uh, state associations, uh, even of uh, new laws that some state have voted that helps hair's property situations. Um, and, and it's nationwide, you know, that problem, you know, the, what we called, uh, what is called the, the black belt, which is from, you know, from Texas all the way to the Carolinas. Uh, it's majority hair's property concentration. So it's, it's really a huge problem. So, um, when I got in there, um, I had to make an artistic decision because whatever the 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 content is, I'm making a film, and I want to make a film which is not a journalistic product. I'm not doing a, a sort of CNN documentary or whatever. You know, it's it's about a film. A film means it's a story with characters, with conflict, with drama, and. And a film that you can watch again. You know, I am not a Negro. You can watch it five, ten times, you know, and you will find something else each time. So for this was the same. I had to focus on making a film, not just the issue itself. So I made artistic choice. I made political choice. The choice of saying, I want Mami and Kim to tell the story. That's an artistic choice. And it's a political choice. Uh, I am not going to make a he said, she said, or he said, he they say kind of film. I'm going to focus on the point of view of the real family. I'm giving them the whole platform. 
they are the one who knows better than anybody else their story. And I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to, uh, uh, to question what they tell me because they pay the price for it already. So I need to trust what they are saying. Somebody who spent eight years for nothing in prison, I need to listen, not to lecture him or to, wow, you could have done this, you could, no, that's not my job. So what I did, I just embedded myself in the family, used all the footage that existed that Lizzie team had already shot as archive and build a film as I would sit down and write a screenplay uh, 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 for a film. The only difference, everything in it is true. You know. Well, thank you, Raul. And thank you for thank a you. beautiful documentary, but also introducing me to the reels and let me see a family that knows their history and also who has something to fight for. I want to thank you very much for thank that. You. Thank you. Now, Raul, talking politics, or, uh, what's happening legislatively to um, protect and support? Uh, huh? To, I didn't understand the word. What's, what's happening uh, in terms of laws being written uh, to help uh, families who are finding themselves in these circumstances? Uh, there are many uh, initiatives. There are some, by the way, uh, I think there are 10 states who vote voted those last years laws that make it less easier for developer or promoter to buy hair's property land. Uh, meaning uh, before it was easy to just use a, a, a law called a Partition Act. And you say like somebody who sometimes never set foot on the piece of land, but through multiple generation is has a stake on that because land. it becomes air property yeah because Not properly uh, uh, air property is basically uh somebody died and leave his property is it doesn't go through the whole uh, uh thing without the paperwork so it falls it's a it's in fact it's not a a, dis, a decision it just fall into that category mm -hmm. so there's nothing you you have to do is and it comes from the the fact that Black people don't trust the justice system, and for good reasons. But in fact, instead of making the inheritance sure, it makes it more fragile. You know, and and so because there are much other laws that gives you the opportunity to to go through it and steal the land, basically. So there are states who made like uh, you cannot let's say auction all the lands because one person wants it is stake is share and and it has to be auctioned and usually on the market price now uh, a judge has to uh, uh, intervene and also consider things like the history of the land things that the importance for the family and the family has the rights to stop that and have a right to to you know, to, to protest, etc. So there are a few things that have been better developed, uh, and but it's still, uh, you know, an ongoing matter. Uh, but you could see it as even when the 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 federal state or the the you know Congress voted, like in the case of black farmers, who are terribly disadvantaged socially and economically. Uh, and who never, for sometimes the same reason of hair's property, but also because they just don't have the means to seek proper defense. So a lot of them are embedded. Though in bear in mind, those are the ones who manage to keep their land, because ninety percent from nineteen twenty to today to the seventies. 90% of black land owners lost their land. So the black farmers who still own land are, for a lot of them, and debt has a huge pile of debt. So Congress voted something like $4 billion for them. And guess what happened? Uh, there, there is a, uh, I forgot the name uh, uh, of this uh, uh, um, 
I think it's something like American First. Uh, it, it's an organization led by Stephen, uh, uh, um, what is the Miller, Trump apprentice. They sue that measure where black farmers who thought, okay, now I can reinvest. Now my debt is raised. I can, and they are caught in limbo because the, the, there is a, a, a suit uh, 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 against them. You know, even when, you know, the, the work paid off that finally Congress do something, you know, it stopped. Uh, another example, the Ministry of Agriculture, they are responsible for the whole topic. And there is a special department uh, uh, who is who has to receive uh, plant uh, complaints from black farmer and minority farmers in general, but a very small percent of the complaints really goes all up to the you know to the last uh, uh, conclusion, and 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 because there are a lot of dysfunction, man, there are a lot of abuse in that. And when Obama became president, there was a sort of attempt of reform, but it was still not really uh, giving results. And and by the way, in, in uh, a common language, you know how they call that department, the last plantation, okay? So it tells you something. So there are lots of articles about those subjects. You know, I, I have like a computer full of those articles, you know, as you know, the last five years, you know, and, I mean, people are informed more or less, but uh, there, there should be a, a more stronger push and, and a, a bigger coalition to solve all those lands problems because it's at the ba base of, of wealth building for, for a big part of, of minorities, you know, because without land, you know, if you're in a, even in urban setting, that's what is happening with gentrification. That's the same process, you know. So, so you can see wherever you turn, it, it's one of the key, uh, uh, you know, core uh, uh, problems. Because if you don't have any kind of property, it's hard to have credit, to have mortgage, to, to do a lot of things, you know, because the system is built to enable people who own something to own more. <laughs> So if you never own anything, and if what you own is taken away from you, so you, you can uh, see what, what are the consequences. You know, Mr. Pet, uh, before you go, Carolyn, uh, your a response begs the question, what best practices can be adopted by uh, people who are going through this? Uh, how can people protect themselves uh, from circumstances like this? What, how can people mobilize to really gain the sort of attention needed for some real change to take place. Okay, one thing that is very efficient, go to the website, silverdollarroad.com. Uh, there, there are a collection of, of organizations working on that. Uh, we have also selection of articles that are dealing with those issues. And in those articles, you have list of people, individual, association, institution dealing with that. So I'm sure wherever uh, anybody is, there is probably uh, somebody you can call and, and have uh, you know uh, better information than I can give here. And so that's one of the things we try to do is for me, a film like this is not uh, an end. It's a beginning of something else. So we try all we can to, to bring all those people together we are working right now on the panel that we hope to be able to, to organize in Washington to alert about all these matters and to make sure, because it's, as you know, in this country, it's a, it's a matter of lobbying. It's a matter of, of putting pressure on your representative. It's a matter of building coalition. It's it's same for everything. So we are trying to do our best. And as for the real family themselves, uh, you know, I made sure that they they are getting help and they are uh, putting their their paperwork in order so that they make sure that uh, beside those thirty acres that that are uh, in, in in litigation, that they make sure that the rest of the property uh, is in a good standing as as the term is. Perfect. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Raul, so something I want to ask you is like, what have you learned um, about yourself as a filmmaker and also just about stories in general? Because for someone who's been making films for well, probably well over 30 years, you've done do you've done other documentaries, you've done narrative um, dramas, you've done biopics. You know, you've done series and all of these different formats of film and in different genres and in different tones. And so with taking all of that, all of your years of experience, I always like to ask directors what they learn about themselves as filmmakers but, and as creatives with each new project. So what did you learn about yourself and like your, your outlook on life and your outlook on filmmaking, especially making documentaries in the process of making Silver Dollar Road? I and mean, especially dealing with um a family because for most of your projects like you've done you've done stories especially for the documentary you've done with stories on people who've already passed you know and like 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 for exterminating all the groups that like you covered hundreds of years of history but this is a history that's still happening you know the, the reels are still alive and they're still fighting so what did you learn as, about yourself as a filmmaker and as a creative making this film? Well, it's it's um. It's a question is hard to answer because I, I don't work in, in asking myself what I learned, but I for me each film is a new frontier. Each film is is a new way to first of all not repeat yourself, but also to push the form and the content as well further. And you can see if if we take like the last three films from I am not your Negro. You know, nobody wanted that film because they couldn't understand that you could make a film like this. I can give you a list of 100 foundations in the U.S. who did not not to want to fund the film because they simply said more or less, you know, you cannot make a film like this. You know, it doesn't work. So uh, when I did Exterminate All the Brutes, that's the same thing. I wanted to make something that as a filmmaker, both in narrative and documentary, I've ne never seen before. Uh, because usually uh, when you try to mix both, it never goes well, because usually people who try that are strong in one and not the other. And and so I knew all the possible uh, trap of this, but I found a way to create something that there is no name for it, but which work. Uh, and the same, the real family is, as uh, I can tell you, the, the risk, uh, artistic risk that I, I took was to simply say, you know what, I'm not going to make a film on two sides. No, I'm taking a position. I am with the real family. You can sue me if you want, but I'm I'm sticking to them. That's their story. No talking heads. Uh I stay within the family, uh, except two exceptions, the lawyer and the uh, 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 Supreme Court judge. Uh, uh, um, uh, that's it. Everybody else are part of the family or close. So that was an artistic risk, especially in this country where everybody said, well, what about the other side? You know, well, what about this white guy who owns it? What does he say? I don't care what he says. The facts are there. That's not my problem. And and one last thing, and and it's uh, you know, uh, you can see usually what our documentary are made today. You know, it's like almost you are obliged to have a trailer at the beginning so that the viewer knows what it is about. And I said no. I want people to feel at ease first with this family to discover they are real human beings. They are not victims. They are not complaining they are they are just a family and you need to come close to them first to see them as human beings and then when the drama comes then it's really hit you at home because you have been close to them but they are you so those, those are the things i think i i develop uh, over the time but i'm you know each film and i think for most filmmaker you know you don't really dwell on whatever you did before. It's about, okay, what's the next step? Uh, can I push the envelope further? Can I find something new that, you know, you don't want to be either bored by your own work. So you want to 
be in a searching uh, situation. You want to go further. You want to to uh, risk uh, uh, more. You want to uh, uh, try new things. You know, and and that's what keeps you going as an artist. You know, it's, it's you know the same way as a painter or a musician. You 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 uh, you know uh, work your style. You work your instrument you work your your knowledge and you take advantage of your experiences great thank you so much and like every well i think every filmmaker can learn something from your vast repertoire of films and from making this particular film in general thank you so much and yes we don't need to know all the opinions of the white people like they can like they get enough that we get to hear enough about them but well thank you so we, we came very late in the film industry and and so <laughs> Uh, you know, so we have so much to catch up. So I don't want to waste any minutes of the films I make to 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 voice again voices that we have heard all our lives. Mm, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Peck, again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we love your work and uh, we'll certainly continue to support every story that you take the time to tell. On behalf of the world's largest group of Black film and TV critics, thank you. And thank you for watching this edition of After Roundtables. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all. Absolutely. Thank you. 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 Appreciate you.